Catherine Mansfield, The Daughters of the Late Colonel, narrated by Lina Slovak. Chapter 1 The week after was one of the busiest weeks of their lives. Even when they went to bed, it was only their bodies that lay down and rested. Their minds went on, thinking things out, talking things over, wondering, deciding, trying to remember where. Constantia lay like a statue, her hands by her sides, her feet just overlapping each other, the shade up to her chin. She stared at the ceiling. Do you think father would mind if we gave his top hat to the porter? The porter? snapped Josephine. Why ever the porter? What a very extraordinary idea. Because, said Constantia slowly, he must often have to go to funerals. And I noticed at, at the cemetery, that he only had a polar. She paused. I thought then how very much he'd appreciate a top hat. We ought to give him a present, too. He was always very nice to father. But, cried Josephine, flouncing on her pillow, and staring across the dark at Constantia. Father's head! And suddenly, for one awful moment, she nearly giggled. Not, of course, that she felt in the least like giggling. It must have been habit. Years ago, when they had stayed awake at night talking, the beds had simply heaved. And now the porter's head, disappearing, popped out like a candle under father's hat. The giggle mounted, mounted. She clenched her hands. She fought it down. She frowned fiercely at the dark and said, Remember, terribly sternly, we can decide tomorrow, she said. Constantia had noticed nothing. She sighed. Do you think we ought to have our dressing gowns dyed as well? Black? Almost shrieked Josephine. Well, what else? said Constantia. I was thinking. It doesn't seem quite sincere, in a way, to wear black out of doors and when we're fully dressed and then when we're at home. But nobody sees us, said Josephine. She gave the bedclothes such a twitch that both her feet became uncovered and she had to creep up the pillows to get them well under again. Kate does, said Constantia, and the postman very well might. Josephine thought of the dark slippers which matched her dressing gown and of Constantia's favourite indefinite green ones which went with hers. Black, two black dressing gowns and two pairs of black woolly slippers creeping off to the bathroom like black cats. I don't think that's absolutely necessary, said she. Silence. Then Constantia said, We shall have to post the papers with a notice in them tomorrow to catch the sale on mail. How many letters have we had till now? 23. Josephine had replied to them all. 
and twenty-three times when she came to, we miss our dear father so much, she had broken down and had to use her handkerchief, and on some of them even to soak up a very light blue tear with an edge of blotting paper. Strange. She couldn't have put it on, but twenty-three times. Even now, though, when she said over to herself, sadly, we miss our dear father so much, she could have cried if she'd wanted to. Have you got enough stamps? Came from Constantia. Oh, how can I tell? Said Josephine crossly. What's the good of asking me that now? I was just wondering," said Constantia mildly. Silence again. There came a little rustle, a scurry, a hop. A mouse," said Constantia. "It can't be a mouse because there aren't any crumbs," said Josephine. "But it doesn't know there aren't." Said Constantia. A spasm of pity squeezed her heart. Poor little thing. She wished she'd left a tiny piece of biscuit on the dressing table. It was awful to think of it not finding anything. What would it do? I can't think how they managed to live at all. She said slowly. Who? demanded Josephine. And Constantia said more loudly than she meant to, "Mice." Josephine was furious. Oh, what nonsense, Con! She said. What have mice have to do with it? You're asleep. I don't think I am," said Constantia. She shut her eyes to make sure. She was. Josephine arched her spine, pulled up her knees, folded her arms so that her fists came under her ears, and pressed her cheek hard against the pillow. Chapter Two. Another thing that complicated matters was they had Nurse Andrews staying on with them that week. It was their own fault. They had asked her. It was Josephine's idea. On the morning, well, on the last morning, when the doctor had gone, Josephine had said to Constantia. Don't you think it would be rather nice if we asked Nurse Andrews to stay on for a week as our guest? Very nice," said Constantia. "I thought," went on Josephine quickly. "I should just say this afternoon, after I've paid her, my sister and I would be very pleased after all you've done for us, Nurse Andrews." If you would stay on for a week as our guest, I'd have to put on that in about being our guest in case. Oh, but she could hardly expect to be paid," cried Constantia. "One never knows," said Josephine sagely. Nurse Andrews had, of course, jumped at the idea. But it was a bother. It meant they had to have a regular sit-down meals at the proper times, whereas if they had been alone, they could just have asked Kate if she wouldn't have minded bringing them a tray whenever they were. And meal times now that the strain was over were rather a trial. Nurse Andrews was simply fearful about butter. Really, 
They couldn't help feeling that about Butter, at least. She took advantage of their kindness. And she had that maddening habit of asking for just an inch more of bread to finish what she had on her plate. And then, at the last mouthful, absent-mindedly, of course, it wasn't absent-mindedly, taking another helping. Josephine got very red when this happened, and she fastened her small, bead-like eyes on the tablecloth as if she saw a minute strange insect creeping through the web of it. But Constantia's long, pale face lengthened and set, and she gazed away, away, far over the desert, to where that line of camels unwound like a threat of war. When I was with Lady Tux, said Nurse Andreas, she had such a daintly little contrivance for the butter. It was a silver cupid balanced on the, on the border of a glass dish, holding a tiny fork. And when you wanted some butter, you simply pressed his foot and he bent down and speared you a piece. It was quite a game. Josephine could hardly bear that. But I think those things are very extravagant, was all she said. But way, asked Nurse Andrews, beaming through her eyeglasses. No one surely would take more butter than one wanted, would one? Ring, Khan, cried Josephine. She couldn't trust herself to reply. And proud young Kate, the enchanted princess, came in to see what the old chubbies wanted now. She snatched away the plates of mock, something or other, and slapped down a wide, terrified blanc -mange. Jam, please, Kate, said Josephine kindly. Kate knelt and burst open the sideboard, lifted the lid of the jam pot, side was empty, put it on the table and stalked off. I'm afraid, said Nurse Andrews a moment later, there isn't any. Oh, what a bother, said Josephine. She bit her lip. What had we better do? Constantia looked dubious. We can't disturb Kate again, she said softly. Nurse Andrews waited, smiling at them both. Her eyes wandered, spying at everything behind the eyeglasses. Constantia, in despair, went back to her camels. Josephine frowned heavily, concentrated. If it hadn't been for this idiotic woman, she and Khan would, of course, have eaten their blancmange without. Suddenly, the idea came. I know, she said. Marmalade. There's some marmalade in the sideboard. Get it, Khan. I hope, laughed Nurse Andrews and her laugh was like a spoon tingling against the medicine glass. I hope it's not a very bitter marmalade. Chapter 3 But after all, it was not long now, and then she'd gone for good. And there was no getting over the fact that she had been very kind to father. She had nursed him day and night at the end. Indeed, both Constantia and Josephine felt privately she had rather overdone than not leaving him at the very last. For when they had gone in to say goodbye, 
Nurse Andrews had sat beside his bed the whole time, holding his wrist and pretending to look at her watch. It couldn't have been necessary. It was tactless, too. Supposing father had wanted to say something, something private to them. Not that he had. Oh, far from it. He lay there, purple, a dark, angry purple in the face, and never even looked at them when they came in. Then, as they were standing there, wondering what to do, he had suddenly opened an eye. Oh, what a difference it would have made. What a difference to their memory of him. How much easier to tell people about it if he had only opened both. But no, one eye only. It glared at them a moment and then went out. Chapter 4 It had made it very awkward for them when Mr. Farrells of St. John's called the same afternoon. The end was quite peaceful, I trust, were the first words he said as he glided towards them through the dark drawing room. Quite, said Josephine faintly. They both hung their heads. Both of them feel certain that I wasn't at all a peaceful I. Won't you sit down? said Josephine. Thank you, Miss Piner, said Mr. Farrells, gratefully. He folded his coattails and began to lower himself into Father's armchair. But just as he touched it, he almost sprung up and slipped into the next chair instead. He coughed. Josephine clasped her hands. Constantia looked vague. I want you to feel Miss Piner, said Mrs. Farrells, and to you, Miss Constantia, that I am trying to be helpful. I want to be helpful to you both, if you will let me. These are the times, said Mrs. Farrells, very simply and earnestly, when God means us to be helpful to one another. Thank you very much, Mr. Farrells, said Josephine and Constantia. Not at all, said Mr. Farrells gently. He drew his kid gloves through his fingers and leaned forward. And if either of you would like a little communion, either or both of you, here and now, you have only to tell me. A little communion is often very help, a great comfort, he added tenderly. But the idea of a little communion terrified them. What? In the drawing room by themselves? With no, no altar or anything? The piano would be much too high, thought Constantia, and Mr. Farrells could not possibly lean over it with the chalice. And Kate would be sure to come bursting in and interrupt them, thought Josephine. And supposing the bell rang in the middle? It might be somebody important about their mourning. Would they get up reverently and go out, or would they have to wait in torture? Perhaps you will send round a note by your good Kate if you would care for it later, said Mr. Farrells. Oh, yes, thank you very much, they both said. Mr. Farrells got up and took his black straw hat from the round table. And about the funeral, he said softly, I may arrange that, as your dear father's old friend and yours, 
Miss Piner, and Miss Constantia? Josephine and Constantia got up too. I should like it to be quite simple, said Josephine firmly, and not too expensive. At the same time, I should like... A good one that would last, thought dreamy Constantia, as if Josephine were buying a nightgown. But, of course, Josephine didn't say that. One suitable to our father's position. She was very nervous. I'll run round to our good friend, Mr. Knight, said Mr. Farrell smoothingly. I will ask him to come and see you. I am sure you will find him very helpful indeed. Chapter 5 Well, at any rate, all that part of it was over though neither of them could possibly believe that father was never coming back. Josephine had had a moment of absolute terror at the cemetery while the coffin was lowered to think that she and Constantia had done this thing without asking his permission. What would father say when he found out? For he was bound to find out sooner or later. He always did. Buried. You two girls had me buried. She heard his stick thumping. Oh, what would they say? What possible excuse could they make? It sounded such an appalling, heartless thing to do. Such a wicked advantage to take of a person because he happened to be helpless at the moment. The other people seemed to treat it as a matter of course. They were strangers. They couldn't be expected to understand that father was the very last person for such a thing to happen to. No, the entire blame for it all would fall on her and Constantia. And the expense, she thought, stepping into the tight bottom cab. When she had to show him the bills, what would he say then? She heard him absolutely roaring. And do you expect me to pay for this gimcrack excursion of yours? Oh, groaned poor Josephine loud. We shouldn't have done it, Con. And Constantia, pale as a lemon, in all that blackness, said in a frightened whisper, Done what, Jug? Let them buy bury father like that, said Josephine, breaking down and crying into her new queer-smelling awning handkerchief. But what else could we have done? asked Constantia wonderingly. We couldn't have kept him, Jug. We couldn't have kept him unburied. At any rate, not in a flat that size. Josephine blew her nose. The cab was dreadfully stuffy. I don't know, she said forlornly. It is all so dreadful. I feel we ought to have tried to, just for a time at least, to make perfectly sure, one thing certain. And her tears sprang out again. Father will never forgive us for this. Never. Chapter 6 Father would never forgive them. That was what they felt more than ever when, two mornings later, they went into his room to go through his things. They had discussed it quite Calmly. It was even down on Josephine's list of things to be done. Go through father's things and settle about them. But that was a very different matter from saying after breakfast. Well, 
Are you ready, Con? Yes, Jug, when you are. Then I think we'd better get it over. It was dark in the hall. It had been a rule for years, never to disturb father in the morning, whatever happened. And now they were going to open the door without knocking even. Constantia's eyes were enormous at the idea. Josephine felt weak in the knees. You, you go first, she gasped, pushing Constantia. But Constantia said, as she always had said on those occasions, No, Jock, that's not fair. You're the eldest. Josephine was just going to say, what at other times she wouldn't have owed to for the world, what she kept for her very last weapon. But your tallest, when they noticed that the kitchen door was open and there stood Kate. Very stiff, said Josephine, grasping the door handle and doing her best to turn it, as if anything ever deceived Kate. It couldn't be helped. That girl was. Then the door was shut behind them. But, but they weren't in father's room at all. They might have suddenly walked through the wall by mistake into a different flat altogether. Was the door just behind them? They were too frightened to look. Josephine knew that if it was, it was holding itself tight shut. Constantia felt that, like the doors in dreams, it hadn't any handle at all. It was the coldness which made it so awful. All the whiteness, which everything was covered. The blinds were down, a cloth hung over the mirror. A sheet hid in the bed. A huge fan of white paper filled the fireplace. Constantia timidly put out her hand. She almost expected a snowflake to fall. Josephine felt a queer tingling in her nose as if her nose was freezing. Then a cab clop clopped over the cobbles below, and the quiet seemed to shake into little pieces. I had better pull up a blind, said Josephine bravely. Yes, it might be a good idea, whispered Constantia. They only gave the blind a touch, but it flew up and the cord flew after, rolling round the blind stick and the little tassel tapped as if trying to get free. That was too much for Constantia. Don't you think, don't you think we might put it off for another day? She whispered. Why? snapped Josephine feeling as usual much better now that she knew for certain that Constantia was terrified. It's got to be done. But I do wish she wouldn't whisper, Con. I didn't know I was whispering, whispered Constantia. And why do you keep staring at the bed? said Josephine, raising her voice almost defiantly. There's nothing on the bed. Oh, Jug, don't say so, said poor Connie. At any rate, not so loudly. Josephine felt herself that she had gone too far. She took a wide swerve over to the chest of drawers, put out her hand, but quickly drew it back again. Connie, she gasped, 
and she wheeled round and leaned with her back against the chest of drawers. Oh, Jug, what? Josephine could only glare. She had the most extraordinary feeling that she had just escaped something simply awful. But how could she explain to Constantia that father was in the chest of drawers? He was watching there, hidden away, just behind the door handle, ready to spring. She pulled a funny old-fashioned face at Constantia, just as she used to in the old days when she was going to cry. I can't open, she nearly wailed. No, don't, Jug, whispered Constantia earnestly. It's much better not to. Let's not. Don't let's open anything. At any rate, not for a long time. But, but it seems so weak, said Josephine, breaking down. But why not be weak for once, Jug? argued Constantia, whispering quite fiercely. If it's weak. And her pale stare flew from the locked writing table, so safe to the huge, glittering wardrobe. And she began to breathe in a queer, panting away. Why shouldn't we be weak for once in our lives, Jog? It's quite excusable. Let's be weak. Be weak, Jog. It's much nicer to be weak than to be strong. And then she did one of those amazingly bold things that she'd done about twice before in their lives. She marched over to the wardrobe, turned the key and took it out of the lock. Took it out of the lock and held it up to Josephine, showing Josephine by her extraordinary smile that she knew what she'd done. She'd risked deliberately father being in there among his overcoats. If the huge wardrobe had lurched forward, had crashed down on Constantia, Josephine wouldn't have been surprised. On the contrary, she would have thought it the only suitable thing to happen. But nothing happened. Only the room seemed quieter than ever, and the bigger flakes of cold air fell on Josephine's shoulders and knees. She began to shiver. Come, Jug, said Constantia, still with that awful callous smile, and Josephine followed, just as she had that last time when Constantia had pushed Benny into the round pond. Chapter 7 But the strain told on them when they were back in the dining room. They sat down, very shaky, and looked at each other. I don't feel I can settle to anything, said Josephine, until I've had something. Do you think we could ask Kate for two cups of hot water? I really don't see why we shouldn't, said Constantia carefully. She was quite normal again. I won't ring. I'll go to the kitchen door and ask her. Yes, do, said Josephine, sinking down into a chair. Tell her, just two cups, Con, nothing else, on a tray. She needn't even put the jug on, need she, 
said Constantia, as though Kate might very well complain if the jug had been there. Oh no, certainly not. The jugs are not at all necessary. She can pour it direct out of a kettle, cried Josephine, feeling that it would be a labour-saving deed. Their cold lips quivered at the greenish brims. Josephine curved her small red hands round the cup. Constantia sat up and blew on the wavy steam, making it flutter from one side to the other. Speaking of Benny, said Josephine, and though Benny hadn't been mentioned, Constantia immediately looked as though he had. He'll expect us to send him something of father's, of course, but it's so difficult to know what to send to Ceylon. You mean things get unstuck, so, on the voyage, murmured Constantia. No, lost, said Josephine sharply. You know there's no post, only runners. Both passed to watch a black man in white linen drawers, running through the pale fields of for dear life with a large brown paper parcel in his hands. Josephine's black man was tiny. He scurried along, glistening like an aunt. But there was something blind and tireless about Constantia's tall, thin fellow, which made him, she decided, a very unpleasant person indeed. On the veranda, dressed all in white and wearing a cork helmet, stood Benny. His right hand shook up and down, as fathers did when he was impatient. And behind him, not in the least interested, sat Hilda, the unknown sister-in-law. She swung in a cane rocker and flicked over the leaves of the tattler. I think his watch would be the most suitable present, said Josephine. Constantia looked up. She seemed surprised. Oh, would you trust a gold watch to a native? But of course I'll disguise it, said Josephine. No one would know it was a watch. She liked the idea of having to make a parcel such a curious shape that no one could possibly guess what it was. She even thought for a moment of hiding the watch in a narrow cardboard corset box that she'd kept by her for a long time waiting for it to come in for something. It was such beautiful, firm cardboard. But no, it wouldn't be appropriate for this occasion. It had lettering on it. Medium women's 28, extra firm basques. It would be almost too much of a surprise for Benny to open that and find father's watch inside. And of course, it isn't as though it would be going, ticking, I mean, said Constantia, who was still thinking of the native love of jewellery. At least, she added, it would be very strange if after all that time it was. Chapter 8 Josephine made no reply. She had flown off on one of her tangents. She had suddenly thought of Cyril. 
Wasn't it more usual for the only grandson to have the watch? And then, dear Cyril, was so appreciative, and a gold watch meant so much to a young man. Benny, in all probability, had quite got out of the habit of watches. Men so seldom wore waistcoats in those hot climates, whereas Cyril in London wore them from year's end to year's end. And it would be so nice for her and Constantia when he came to tea to know it was there. I see you've got on Grandfather's watch, Cyril. It would be somehow so satisfactory. Dear boy, what a blow his sweet, sympathetic little note had been. Of course, they quite understood, but it was most unfortunate. It would have been such a point having him said Josephine. And he would have enjoyed it too, said Constantia, not thinking what she was saying. However, as soon as he got back, he was coming to tea with his aunties. Cyril to tea was one of their rare treats. Now, Cyril, you mustn't be frightened of our cakes. Your auntie Con and I bought them at Balsart's this morning. We know what a man's appetite is, so don't be ashamed of making a good tea. Josephine cut recklessly into the rich dark cake that stood for her winter gloves or the soling and healing of Constantia's only respectable shoes. But Cyril was most unmanlike in appetite. I say, Aunt Josephine, I simply can't. I've only just had lunch, you know. Oh, Cyril, that can't be true. It's after four, cried Josephine. Constantia sat with her knife poised over the chocolate roll. It is all the same said Cyril. I had to meet a man at Victoria and he kept me hanging about till there was only time to get lunch and to come on hair and he gave me, phew, Cyril put his hand to his forehead, a terrific blowout, he said. It was disappointing, two day of all days, but still, he couldn't be expected to know. But you'll have a meringue, won't you, Cyril? said Aunt Josephine. These meringues were bought especially for you. Your dear father was so fond of them. We were sure you are, too. I am, Aunt Josephine, cried Cyril ardently. Do you mind if I take half to begin with? Not at all, dear boy, but we mustn't let you off with that. Is your dear father still so fond of meringues? asked Auntie Con gently. She winced faintly as she broke through the shell of hers. Well, I don't quite know. Auntie Con, said Cyril breezingly. At that, they both looked up. Don't know, almost snapped Josephine. Don't know a thing like that about your own father, Cyril. Surely, said Auntie Con softly. Cyril tried to laugh it off. Oh, well, he said. It's such a long time since. He faltered. He stopped. Their faces were too much for him. Even so, said Josephine. And Auntie Con looked. 
Cyril put down his teacup. Wait a bit, he cried. Wait a bit, Aunt Josephine. What am I thinking of? He looked up. They were beginning to brighten. Cyril slapped his knee. Of course, he said. It was meringues. How could I have forgotten? Yes, Aunt Josephine, you are perfectly right. Father's most frightfully keen on meringues. They didn't only beam. Aunt Josephine went scarlet with pleasure. Auntie Con gave a deep, deep sigh. And now, Cyril, you must come and see Father, said Josephine. He knows you are coming today. Right, said Cyril, very firmly and heartily. He got up from his chair. Suddenly, he glanced at the clock. I say, Aunt Con, isn't your clock a bit slow? I've got to meet a man at Paddington just after five. I am afraid I shan't be able to stay very long with Grandfather. Oh, he won't expect you to stay very long, said Aunt Josephine. Constantia was still gazing at the clock. She couldn't make up her mind if it was fast or slow. It was one or the other. She felt almost certain of that. At any rate, it had been. Cyril still lingered. Aren't you coming along, Auntie Con? Of course, said Josephine. We shall all go. Come on, Con. Chapter 9 They knocked at the door, and Cyril followed his aunts into Grandfather's hot, Swedish room. Come on, said Grandfather Piner. Don't hang about. What is it? What have you been up to? He was sitting in front of a roaring fire, clasping his stick. He had a thick rug over his knees. On his lap, there, lay a beautiful pale yellow silk handkerchief. It's Cyril, father, said Josephine shyly. And she took Cyril's hand and led him forward. Good afternoon, grandfather, said Cyril, trying to take his hand out of Aunt Josephine's. Grandfather Piner shot his eyes at Cyril in the way he was famous for. Where was Auntie Con? She stood on the other side of Aunt Josephine. Her long arms hung down in front of her. Her hands were clasped. She never took her eyes off Grandfather. Well, said Grandfather Piner, beginning to thump. What have you got to tell me? What had he, what had he got to tell him? Cyril felt himself smiling like a perfect imbecile. The room was stifling, too. But Aunt Josephine came to his rescue. She cried brightly. Cyril says his father is still very fond of meringues, father dear. Eh? said Grandfather Piner, curving his hand like a purple meringue shell over one ear. Josephine repeated. Cyril says his father is still very fond of meringues. Can't hear, said old Colonel Piner. And he waved Josephine away with his stick, then pointed with his stick to Cyril. Tell me what she's trying to say, he said. My God! Must I? 
said Cyril, blushing and staring at Aunt Josephine. Too dear, she smiled. It would please him so much. Come on, out with it, cried Colonel Piner testily, beginning to thump again. And Cyril leaned forward and yelled, Father's still very fond of meringues. At that, Grandfather Piner jumped as though he had been shot. Don't shout, he cried. What's the matter with the boy? Meringues, what about them? Oh, Aunt Josephine, must we go on? groaned Cyril desperately. It's quite all right, dear boy, said Aunt Josephine, as though he and she were at the dentist together. He'll understand in a minute. And she whispered to Cyril, He's getting a bit deaf, you know. Then she leaned forward and really bowed at Grandfather Piner. Cyril only wanted to tell you, Father dear, that his father is still very fond of meringues. Colonel Piner heard that time, heard and brooded, looking Cyril up and down. What an extraordinary thing, said old Grandfather Piner. What an extraordinary thing to come all this way here to tell me. And Cyril felt it was. Yes. I shall send Cyril the watch, said Josephine. That would be very nice, said Constantia. I seem to remember last time he came, there was some little trouble about the time. Chapter 10 They were interrupted by Kate, bursting through the door, in her usual fashion, as though she had discovered some secret panel in the wall. Fried or boiled? asked the bold voice. Fried or boiled? Josephine and Constantia were quite bewildered for the moment. They could hardly take it in. Fried or boiled what, Kate? asked Josephine, trying to begin to concentrate. Kate gave a loud sniff. Fish. Well, why didn't you say so immediately? Josephine reproached her gently. How could you expect us to understand, Kate? There are a great many things in this world, you know which are fried or boiled. And after such a display of courage, she said quite brightly to Constantia, Which do you prefer, Con? I think it might be nice to have it fried, said Constantia. On the other hand, of course, boiled fish is very nice. I think I prefer both equally well. Unless you, in that case. I shall fry it, said Kate, and she bounced back, leaving the door open and slamming the door of her kitchen. Josephine gazed at Constantia. She raised her pale eyebrows until they rippled away into her pale hair. She got up. She said in a very lofty, imposing way. Do you mind following me into the drawing room, Constantia? I've got something of great importance to discuss with you. For it was always to the drawing room they retired when they wanted to talk about Kate. Josephine closed the door meaningly. Sit down, Constantia she said, still very grand. She might have been receiving Constantia for the first time. And Con looked round vaguely for a chair, 
as though she felt indeed quite a stranger. Now, the question is, said Josephine, bending forward, whether we shall keep her or not. That is the question, agreed Consandia. And this time, said Josephine firmly, we must come to a definite decision. Constantia looked for a moment as though she might begin going over all the other times, but she pulled herself together and said, Yes, Jug. You see, Con, explained Josephine, everything is so changed now. Constantia looked up quickly. I mean, went on Josephine, we are not dependent on Kate as we were. And she blushed faintly. There's not father to cook for. That is perfectly true, agreed Constantia. Father certainly doesn't want any cooking now, whatever else. Josephine broke in sharply. You're not sleepy, are you, Con? Sleepy, Jug? Constantia was wide-eyed. Well, concentrate more, said Josephine sharply, and she returned to the subject. What it comes to is, if we did, and this, she barely breathed, glancing at the door. Give Kate notice. She raised her voice again. We could manage our own food. Why not? cried Constantia. She couldn't help smiling. The idea was so exciting. She clasped her hands. What should we leave on, Jug? Oh, eggs in various forms, said Jug lofty again. And besides, there are all the cooked foods. But I've always heard, said Constantia, they are considered so very expensive. Not if one buys them in moderation, says Josephine. But she tore herself away from this fascinating bypath and dragged Constantia after her. What we've got to decide now, however, is whether we really do trust Kate or not. Constantia leaned back. Her flat little laugh flew from her lips. Isn't it curious, Jack, said she, that just on this one subject I've never been able to quite make up my mind? Chapter 11 She never had. The whole difficulty was to prove anything. How did one prove things? How could one? Suppose Kate had stood in front of her and deliberately made a face. Mightn't she very well have been in pain? Wasn't it impossible, at any rate, to ask Kate if she was making a face at her? If Kate answered no, and of course she would say no, what a position. How undignified. Then again, Constantia suspected she was almost certain that Kate went to her chest of drawers when she and Josephine were out, not to take things, but to spy. Many times she had come back to find her amethyst cross in the most unlikely places, under her lace ties or on top of her evening bertha. More than once she had laid a trap for Kate. She had arranged things in a special order and then 
called Josephine to witness. You see, Job? Quite, Con. Now we shall be able to tell. But, oh dear, when she did go to look, she was as far off from a proof as ever. If anything was displaced, it might so very well have happened as she closed the drawer. A jolt might have done it so easily. You come, Jack, and decide. I really can't. It's too difficult. But after a pause and a long glare, Josephine would sigh. Now you've put the doubt into my mind, Con. I'm sure I can't tell myself. Well, we can't postpone it again, said Josephine. If we postpone it this time. Chapter 12 But at that moment in the street below, a barrel organ struck up. Josephine and Constantia sprang to their feet together. Run, Con, said Josephine. Run, quickly. There's a sixpence on thee. Then they remembered. It didn't matter. They would never have to stop the organ grinder again. Never again would she and Constantia be told to make that monkey take his noise somewhere else. Never would sound that loud, strange bellow when father thought they were not hearing enough. The organ grinder might play there all day and the stick would not thump. It never will thump again. It never will thump again, played the barrel organ. What was Constantia thinking? She had such a strange smile. She looked different. She couldn't be going to cry. Jug, jug, said Constantia softly, pressing her hands together. Do you know what day it is? It's a Saturday. It's a week today, a whole week. A week since father died. A week since father died, cried the barrel organ. And Josephine, too, forgot to be practical and sensible. She smiled faintly, strangely. On the Indian carpet, there fell a square of sunlight, pale red. It came and went, and came, and stayed, deepened until it shone almost golden. The sun's out, said Josephine, as though it really mattered. A perfect fountain of babbling notes shook from the barrel organ, round, bright notes, carelessly scattered. Constantia lifted her big, cold hands, as if to catch them, and then her hands fell again. She walked over to the mantelpiece to her favourite Buddha, and the stone and gilt image, whose smile always gave her such a queer feeling, almost a pain, and yet a pleasant pain, seemed today to be more than smiling. He knew something. He had a secret. I know something that you don't know, said her Buddha. Oh, what was it? What could it be? And yet, she had always felt there was something. The sunlight pressed through the windows, thieved its way in, flashed its light over the furniture and the photographs. 
Josephine watched it. When it came to mother's photograph, the enlargement over the piano, it lingered as though puzzled to find so little remained of mother, except the earring shaped like tiny pagodas and a black feather bow. Why did the photographs of dead people always fade so? wondered Josephine. As soon as a person was dead, the photograph died too. But of course, this one of mother was very old. It was 35 years old. Josephine remembered standing on a chair and pointing out that feather boa to Constantia and telling her that it was a snake that had killed their mother in Ceylon. Would everything have been different if mother hadn't died? She didn't see why. Aunt Florence had lived with them until they had left school, and they had moved three times, and had their yearly holiday, and, and, there had been changes of servants, of course. Some little sparrows, Young sparrows, they sounded, chirped on the window ledge. Yeep, aib, yeep. But Josephine felt they were not sparrows, not on the window ledge. It was inside her, that queer little crying noise. Weep, aib, weep. Ah, oh, that was it, crying, so weak and forlorn. If mother had lived, might they have married? But there had been nobody for them to marry. There had been father's Anglo-Indian friends before he quarrelled with them. But after that, she and Constantia never met a single man, except clergymen. How did one meet men? Or, even if they'd met them, how could they have got to know men well enough to be more than strangers? One read of people having adventures, being followed, and so on. But nobody had ever followed Constantia and her. Oh yes, there had been one year at Isburn, a mysterious man at the boarding house who had put a note on the jug of hot water outside the bedroom door. But by the time Connie had found it, the steam had made the writing too faint to read. They couldn't even make out to which of them it was addressed, and he had left next day, and that was all. The rest had been looking after father, and at the same time keeping out of father's way. But now? But now? The thieving son touched Josephine gently. She lifted her face. She was drawn over to the window by gentle beams. Until the barrel organ stopped playing, Constantia stayed before the Buddha, wondering, but not as usual, not vaguely. This time, her wonder was like longing. She remembered the times she had come in here, crept out of bed, in her nightgown, when the moon was full, and laying on the floor with her arms outstretched, as though she was crucified. Why? The big pale moon had made her do it. The horrible dancing figures on the carved screen had leered at her, and she hadn't minded. She remembered, too, how. Whenever they were at the seaside, 
she had gone off by herself and got as close to the sea as she could and sung something, something she had made up while she gazed all over that restless water. There had been this other life, running out, bringing things home in bags, getting things on approval, discussing them with Jack and taking them back to get more things on approval and arranging father's trays and trying not to annoy father. But it all seemed to have happened in a kind of tunnel. It wasn't real. It was only when she came out of the tunnel into the moonlight, all by the sea, all into a thunderstorm, that she really felt herself. What did it mean? What was it she was always wanting? What did it all lead to? Now? Now? She turned away from the Buddha with one of her vague gestures. She went over to where Josephine was standing. She wanted to say something to Josephine, something frightfully important about... about the future and what... Don't you think perhaps... she began. But Josephine interrupted her. I was wondering if now, she murmured. They stopped. They waited for each other. Go on, Con, said Josephine. No, no, Jug, after you, said Constantia. No, say what you were going to say. You begun, said Josephine. I, I'd rather hear what you were going to say first said Constantia. Don't be absurd, Con. Really, Jug. Connie? Oh, Jug. A pause. Then Constantia said faintly, I can't say what I was going to say, Jug, because I've forgotten what it was that I was going to say. Josephine was silent for a moment. She stared at a big cloud where the sun had been. Then she replied shortly. I've forgotten, too. <laughs>